I think we're ready to get started. Excellent. Hello, everybody. Thanks so much for coming on a beautiful Saturday when you could be out playing. Um, I'm Jake Shapiro. I'm the CEO and co-founder of a company called Radio Public, and I've asked my partner in crime and colleague, Elizabeth Hansen, to join me. She's the director of the business models research at the Shorenstein Center at Harvard University um, and has her own interest in the podcast side of things. You want to explain that? Yeah, sure. So I study... Um sustainable business models for local news and the relationship between publishers and platforms um, and podcasting. Right. Um, so the idea today was to talk about podcast strategy. I have an opening question. How many here have their own podcast? Hmm. That's pretty good. Yeah, maybe That's like 25% of the room. Uh, how many people are thinking of starting their own podcast? Thank you. How many listen to podcasts on a regular basis? Okay, how many Android phone users? And how many iOS? Okay. Got it. Even here in Europe, that's surprising <laughs> to me. Um, so you can tweet some questions to us along the way, which we'll try to get to, um, and I'll open it up for Q&A. Uh, we started a little late from technical difficulties, but we'll get started. I'm definitely speaking to uh, my experience in more of the US uh, podcast industry, which has really taken shape and started to accelerate a lot in the last few years. Um, and if you've been paying attention to some of that, just in the past few months, there's been some major headlines. Um, hundreds of millions of dollars are being invested in the growth of podcasting. This is just for the last couple months where Spotify made major acquisitions of Gimlet and Anchor, a new $100 million podcast startup that is pre-product pre raised $100 million to invest in the so-called Netflix. So of course, um, as this happens cyclically in our industry and others, the question is, is this a bubble? Um, I don't actually think it's a bubble. I think we're still in the early days of the growth of podcasting for a lot of fundamental reasons. Um, and I think it's helpful to scroll back a little bit and I can explain, because um, I've been a witness to it from its inception, the, what I describe as the three waves of podcast adoption since it began. Um, it really, back in 2003, was the first podcast. So this was at the Berkman Klein Center at Harvard University. Um, I was uh, the associate director there and left to start a company called PRX, which publishes and distributes lots of uh, podcasts and public radio. And the blogging pioneer, Dave Weiner, um, along with my former radio boss, Chris Lydon, attached the first MP3 to the first RSS feed and podcasting began really at a moment when blogging was just getting started too. So it was sort of co-incidental with the democratization of publishing. So audio blogging and podcasting and blogging were all starting around the same time with a lot of the same technology. Um, and so 2003 was the beginning of that. And in 2005, um, Apple woke up to it. Um, this is a great uh, 2005 snapshot of iTunes which they basically just jammed podcasts into iTunes, which, you know, my version of why they did that was Steve Jobs was unhappy with the record industry and, you know, selling songs for $1.99 with DRM and podcasts for free. They were high quality. They didn't cost anything. And they got more iPods sold. Um, but really, it, it sort of stayed uh, sort of slowly, incrementally growing um, until uh, 2008. Um, which I mark as the second wave in part because that's the fall that the App Store launched. So really 2007, 2008 when the smartphones began, 
suddenly audio um, made a lot of sense uh, in the digital world. Prior to that, I mean, if you remember trying to navigate audio on the web, you used to have these like real players and QuickTime players and Winamp players and they're jammed into web pages and it was a terrible experience and not a lot of internet users would listen to audio, still don't, long form on the web, but suddenly the phone is an obvious transcending device to make audio make sense in a mobile and digital environment. Um, it's a receiver, it's another sort of transistor radio walking around in your pocket and for sending and receiving. Um, so really it was the advent of smartphones and the app stores that opened up the ability for publishers to create content directly for that audience. It was also the habituation of consumers towards on-demand access to media. So YouTube and Netflix and Spotify had started to teach everybody that on their phone you could get really high quality media. Um, but another trend was that advertisers who had seen the rise of mobile as a, as a challenge because all the display ads and other ways of managing advertising weren't working so well, mm -hmm. but audio was bypassing that into a very engaged consumer and they started to get more interested in figuring out how to tap into that audience through mobile. Um, and then of course another driver, and this has been true even more so today, is publishers um, who otherwise are being uh, frustrated by the platform's concentration of the audience attention, um, see podcasting as another way to reach a direct audience and have a relationship with them. So um, the third wave, uh, really, and you can almost mark it on the calendar, it's like the fall of 2014 is really the beginning of the modern podcast industry. So we're only five years in. All of that, rest of it from 2003 was sort of prehistory. Um, but 2014 marks the beginning of what we're now in as a podcast industry, and a couple important things happened then, which were signifiers. One is the Apple took that podcast app out of iTunes and made it its own standalone app on the iPhone. That was the first time they'd done that, and it was default installed with the next iOS update. So suddenly millions of people had a weird purple icon on their phone, and they started hitting it, and so a lot more people started listening to podcasts based just on that technical incremental innovation. That was the same year that Serial launched. That was when Gimlet launched. That's when we launched, at PRX, we launched Radiotopia, the podcast network. It's when Slate launched the Panoply network. There was really a sense already at that moment that those trends I'd been describing had coalesced and reached a tipping point where there was enough of a audience, enough revenue, enough growth, enough distribution that investing in the rest of the value chain made sense. And so you can see it as you look at the, then the numbers um, since then. Um, so this is just a few slides showing what we now know as the baseline for um, the inflection point of growth in podcasting. This is a U.S. audience. This is a U.S. audience, that's right. And so what do we have? We have 144 million who have at least listened uh, to a podcast in the U.S. Um, weekly, that now is 62 million. Weekly is important because that's kind of the cadence of a lot of podcast listening. Of course, there are people listening every day, but a lot of podcasts publish on a weekly basis, and weekly is a nice metric to think about. So 62 million weekly listeners, which is um, more than double than it was uh, back in that 2014 kind of launch moment. Um, and then I think this is interesting, too, and there's some questions about what they mean by podcasts, but seven podcasts is the average, uh, what uh, U.S. average listeners listen to if you're listening to podcasts, which has also gone up. It used to be five, and then six, and now seven. Um, but, you know, that shows that there's both a limited uh, window to get into somebody's uh, time and attention, but also that it's a healthy appetite for this medium. Um, and then uh, we may get a chance to return to this, but smart speaker ownership, which, you know, is not, I think, directly a component of podcasting. It's another channel of all audio listening and all sort of interactive voice um, but it's a driver that I think will be increasingly interesting to look at for podcasting. So when I look at that, um, part of what we see is this strange kind of gap, which is this huge growth of audience and attention and activity, but a pretty small top line revenue number. So this has been the mystery and the sort of question for the industry, which is how come it's only generating $300 million, you know, which if you look at another business like radio in the U.S., the broadcast side of radio advertising alone is $15 billion a year, and podcasting in 2018 was estimated to be $300 million. It's just, it's just a tiny little bit. Um, that's not necessarily the right comparison, and I would argue that that number is underestimated for a bunch of reasons. And in 2018, 2019, it's expected to be $700 million, so we're more than doubling. Uh, but that's still under a billion dollars for an industry that many of us believe is way more valuable than that. And the majority of the podcasters, as we've now had this influx of publishing coming in, are still not making any money at all, um, which is fine. Sometimes people are doing it for other reasons, much like you know every other digital medium that can be a hobbyist medium or a you know an ancillary medium to something else. Not all of them are measured by revenue, for sure, um, but it is a steep drop off um, right now from the top of the tail 
down to what the small percentages of revenue that are scattered across the long tail are doing. Um, and I think we can talk more about that because that's one of the fascinating parts of the industry, which is that it's five years into this huge growth, but it's still up for grabs in a lot of ways, which is unusual for a robust digital media where, you know, it's uh, part of what makes it unnerving and exciting to be in it is that every three months it feels like some new evolution is happening and we don't yet know where the center of gravity is, um, which I think is a great opportunity for publishers and people who care about building a healthy digital media ecosystem to have podcasting be one of the places we can still influence the trajectory of the whole ecosystem's growth. So when we think about some of those problems, and one problem being the lag between audience attention and growth and the revenue that's spread across the industry, uh, the other common problems that are cited around discovery and engagement and data. Um, so. You know, when you, I'm curious, um, how many people found the latest podcast they wanted to listen to through word of mouth? Was it somebody telling you? Yes. Um, that is still the majority of discovery. So discovery, it tends to be word of mouth. Um, often you're hearing podcasts promoted on other podcasts. Uh, so there's sort of a primitive way to, to market these things. Um, the platforms, unlike Facebook and Google, and even Spotify and music haven't really designed the clever algorithms to manage discovery in an automated, scalable way. Podcasting is kind of different in that way too. It's, it's harder as spoken word and narrower as a genre. Um, and also just the, the, because the whole industry is only taking shape in the last five years, a lot of the other pieces of the building blocks, um, advertising technology, analytics, marketing tech, all those things that exist in other digital media haven't yet been built or are just now being built in podcasting. So you're seeing a range of that just happening in real time. So when I pull back and look at the whole market, you know, the feeling of it is that it's certainly accelerating. This is just the pace of increased publishing. So there are something like 30,000 new podcasts being launched every month, um, which is kind of a shocking number. And we're now, this is already outpaced. I think there's now 700,000 podcasts in existence. Now, there's asterisks to all this. So, you know, most of those podcasts um, are ones that are people just trying it and abandoning it, or they're just, you know, they're not real or it won't last. Of those 700,000, I think there's probably less than half that are active or being listened to by any measurable number. But just the velocity and kind of influx of it is pretty stunning, which of course makes the discovery problem even harder. Um, and a, a challenge for it. But it's, it's enabled by the, you know, all of the trends that I described, um, including the, law, the relatively low cost, and this is something we'll return to, production for podcasts, certainly compared to most other high quality digital media. Um, and it's becoming um, a long tail marketplace. So what I love about it is that you, know, you have a diversity of these niche audiences, fan bases, creator cultures, you know, styles of production, all the kinds of things that radio, which I came from in public radio, had an inevitably very narrow band to treat because you would have one format or two formats. Um, so podcasting explodes that and you have an incredible range of niche um, podcasts that are serving all kinds of different communities. And again, we're still early, so you're seeing evolution of the craft and formats and ways of producing um, that are still just now getting a, a feedback loop of even how they're performing to reinvest in them. Um, and we're seeing that some of the top creators, and this is that yellow band, are, are making real money. Um, so there are like significant multi-million dollar businesses from podcast studios with podcasts as their core product, uh, not just a secondary thing. And that's new as a trend. Um, and against that, this is sort of recapping some of this, the audience growth, which includes a global number here of 484 million. Um, I have not a lot of data supporting that. That was taken out of a Spotify SEC filing somewhere where they said that number, which I have no idea if it's true. It's hard to get global numbers for podcasting and it's very unevenly distributed currently. And I'd be curious to hear your experience um, from Europe about where it's working and not. Um, but nonetheless, that you know that is part of the market growth for it. And as I was just saying, the thing that um, is a real inhibitor but also an opportunity is that it's so fragmented. Um, podcasting is still decentralized. It's still built on one of the ancient protocols of the web, RSS, much like email or HTML. This is just um, not a very sophisticated uh, protocol, but one that isn't controlled by any single party, which means that largely it's been through aggregation that the platforms are making podcasts available. It also means that anybody can publish one without having to go get permission from any particular gatekeeper. Uh, but it's also meant that the revenue and attention and marketing are all also fragmented in ways that are hard to amass. Um, which is unusual, again, for the sort of digital media world we're in. 
in some ways that's protected podcasting from um, getting corrupted by the worst behaviors of other digital media so we don't have you know ad tech fraud and you know terrible clickbait going on we don't have the kinds of things that have really ruined in many ways the consumer experience for digital media on the web um, so in a way it might be a trade-off that we're having slower growth or less money but for a healthier uh, business um, within podcasting um, so you know, my path into this was as someone who had really managed one of the um, early publishers in podcasting, PRX, which now distributes shows like This American Life and the Radiotopia Network and the Moth Radio Hour and, and dozens of other shows. Um, and we were seeing this grow, but also frustrated by the lack of platform um, tools for engaging our audience. Um, Apple, despite having picked up podcasting back in 2005, essentially, the way I describe it, they don't like it when I say this, but, you know, they... they took the cookie and like licked it and put it back on the table. <laughs> um, and then nobody would wanted to touch it. Like so no, cause it was like Apple did it, but they didn't really do it. So that was the amazing slide here, which is this one, I guess. Yeah, that there's, you know, they had, there was actually 14 billion downloads on Apple podcasts alone, uh, but zero dollars that Apple touched or enabled or turned on. They could, and we have kind of be careful what we wish for if we want them to, um, but they haven't. Um, and so when we saw that as a publisher, we decided to take our own steps and create a platform that we wish existed. Um, and so we began building Radio Public a couple years ago, which depending on where this conversation goes, I'll, I'll dive into and explain more of the tools that we've built. Um, but the sort of top headline of it is the Radio Public, which is a startup, it's a public benefit corporation that we spun out of PRX, um, set about to build the consumer facing set of engagement discovery tools and the publisher-facing set of monetization and marketing tools. It's a B2B to B2C to um, platform designed with those needs in mind and designed around some core values and a mission of protecting consumer privacy, which we think podcasting could be a, a, a sort of a poster child for a healthy practice around that, um, but also enabling engagement because it's such a hugely powerful medium. People spend hours and hours listening to their podcast hosts and then the, you know, the state of the art of supporting them is to have to like write their website on a napkin and then they'll go type it in or like buy the product that they mentioned in an in a ad. Um, so it feels like there's a lot to be built within that. Um, so when we get into the tour of a couple of those pieces of it, I'd be happy to walk through elements that might be useful to you as podcasters. Um, but we wanted to pause and like jump into some questions that like I have a feeling are likely or that you Elizabeth sort of pokes me with these questions and says, there's a bunch of things that you just assume people know yeah. and you should like pause and ask about. So um, why don't you start and then sure. we'll facilitate more coming in. And I'll look at, I'll look at my Twitter and see if you guys have sent any meantime. <laughs> okay, great. So yeah, I'm interested in podcasting as a tool for publishers. Um, but like at a very basic level, I'm interested in your pitch when publishers come to you. Wh why podcast? Before we get to what's the strategy? Mm. Why even why do, do it? Why do a podcast? Yeah, why do a podcast? So um, it's not for the faint of heart, for sure. So it's hard to do a good one. But um, it is a uniquely engaging medium. So part of it is that um, voice and the human voice and certainly narrative storytelling, as we know, transcends lots of different kinds of consumer experiences of the web. And at a moment when a lot of times our attention is being kind of fragmented down to tweet length uh, digital snippets, um, podcasting has the unique ability to engage in a long form. Um, and so it's the intimate quality of the human voice as a message and medium and information and narrative journalism storytelling style. It's also that, as I alluded to, it's you know comparatively low cost. The, the, it's, I don't want to overstate that. Is it actually low that. cost? It's low cost in terms of the, oh, the sort of technical tools or production overhead. Mm -hmm. The time and talent is not low cost, low cost. So the things that are hardest to come by is, is the dedication to the craft, um, you know, and the time it takes to actually produce something good. Um, and then I say there's scarcest quality, which is actual talent. The, you know, for a host read, like a medium that depends a lot on the voice or talent or personality of a host, finding someone who has that quality and can sustain the conversation and be a magnet for listening, I think is the critical quality. And that's not cheap. Um, in the terms of finding that and, and containing it, but the rest of it, you know, you can do it these days with a low-cost microphone and find a quiet room and 
um, get started. Of course, you can elaborate up from that, but getting started is uh, simple. You could all start a podcast today, record episode one on your laptop with your current you know, phone as your recording device. There's many free or low-cost publishing tools, and then you're up and running in minutes. Um, so uh, um, compared to video, if you're a publisher thinking of like strategies for like rich media, um, podcast is way more cheap and also engaging. Can we talk about the the business model for a minute? We I spend a lot of my time um, studying and talking to publishers um, who are really struggling to um, find sustainable revenue models. What what is the what is the um, business model of podcasting? Is there one? Is there two? Are there ten? So talk certainly the the lion's share um, of oh, I have been, this is your questions. That's okay. I got them out here. Okay. Too. Yeah. <laughs> We, we teed up the questions we cheated a little bit and they got them on here. Um, so, and I'll flip Excellent. forward to one actually. So here's, here's, a, here's a kind of my current rundown of how podcasters are making money and these are not equal. Um, the lion's share of revenue in podcasting comes through advertising and we can talk a little bit about how that works. Um, uh, it's also still relatively primitive in a way because the ads are baked into the audio itself and sold separately from the platforms. But they're also at high rates. So you're often seeing um, rates for podcast advertising that are 10 times that of what digital media otherwise is for a banner ad or a digital ad on, on web there, or video. Has there been any price pressure on um, Not yet. CPMs? If, if it actually, the CPMs, the cost per thousand, um, are on average 20 to $30 for podcasting as opposed to like a dollar to $2 for many video or for ten, you know, tens of cents for you know, web impressions. Um, it's because that attention is so high and right, the majority of podcast advertisers um, our direct response advertisers who are able to test and prove that the actual standing impression that they left through an ad is very effective. The, re the recall and retention, especially delivered by a host voice, is just super high. So you're, that's why you're hearing these pre-rolls from your favorite hosts talking about, you know, Blue Apron and Casper Mattress and, you know, uh, Squarespace over and over again because it works. Um, and that has kept the, the CPMs high. And for premium publishers like a Gimlet, they're selling for even higher. Um, and the, then the challenge is, is that for smaller podcasters, if you don't reach a critical threshold and there's sort of a rule of thumb around 50,000 downloads per episode being kind of meaningful, it's hard to attract an advertiser to, uh, you know, on a one-off basis. Do you, how long does it take, piece. do you think, to get to the 50,000 mark? I mean, I've seen a podcaster start a podcast and two months later reach that mark, and most, however, it takes like two years, and some never reach it. I mean, it really depends, and sometimes that's not the goal. It depends on if you're trying to reach a broad audience or you're reaching a niche audience. If you, you know, it could be that there's, you know, 2,500 listeners who are the influentials that you want to reach, and there's a brand who wants to reach them too, and you could make an advertising case based on that. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, like, advertising is evolving, and there's also, as part of the growth of the industry since it began again in 2014, um, there's now tools for dynamic ad insertion, uh, which means even though you're still inserting it into the show and then distributing it, um, you can dynamically replace those ads over time. So you might hear Roman Mars from 99% Invisible um, promoting um, a movie that's coming out this weekend, even on an old episode from a year ago that you listened to in the catalog because they're able to stitch that in on the fly as someone's downloading it. And that's opened up more inventory and raised the at least growth of advertising overall. Um, I'm interested in these uh, other business models and these really vary depending on the strategies of the podcasters. Um, you know, we are seeing a trend which I'm very encouraged by around crowdfunding and direct membership models and Patreon, of course, being in the US a big evidence of success of a lot of fans, willingness to support artists of various kinds. Um, and Can public I, radio has a historical stake in that. Yeah, I have a question on the membership. So in my membership panel yesterday, we talked a lot about email newsletters as a kind of channel for building audience, but then also asking for support. How do you do that on a podcast when there isn't, you know, it's not like an email or it's like click here to donate? Yeah, I mean, that, so that this, that, that missing link is one of the things that we've been building a solution to at Radio Public, but for right now, it's still essentially a call to action that takes somebody outside of the podcast mm -hmm. listening experience to some other place. So you'll say, if you love listening to my show, go support me on patreon.com slash my show. And then, you know, hopefully people show up. And then if you sort of pull together other, you know, email newsletters and things like that, you amass it that way. So no direct link. There's no real, I mean, they're starting to see some, like, um, this is also where the App Store rules are problematic. So Apple and Google don't let you as an app developer put in direct donation or membership links unless it's going through their payment processing and they take their 30% cut and there's other rules around it. So there's actually... This is some friction that is not easy to solve and that a lot of us in the industry are trying to sort out because it's an obvious 
place where the moment of intent um, around supporting something you love and are listening to should be available to you in the device that you're listening to it in. Um, so I do see that as growth, but not yet something that's like fixed on the platform side. Um, this is true of all artists and sort of musicians and filmmakers, but live events. Live events have become really a trend in a good way in U.S. for podcasting, where it's both a fan cultivation marketing tactic and actually, for, in some cases, generating real touring revenue, in part because the production costs for podcasts live, you're not putting on a big show. They're really there to see you. Um, so it, this is sort of a, this would be a live podcast right now. If this we is were like charging a, if, you to if be we here. were famous podcasters um, and you were coming to our show, it would look sort of like this unless you wanted like a smoke machine on the side or something to add to it, but that's, um, but they're sold out uh, all over the country. It's amazing. Um, we've seen ven like 2,000 seat venues sold out to see a podcast um, where they're just doing their podcast live. And I think that's kind of an awesome trend to see cool. take shape. Um, another one that's new, uh, licensing. So this, this is both interesting and worrisome, which is there are now premium platforms that have paywalls. <clears throat> where for some, and this is just for the most valuable in some ways, or at least that match the strategies of the platforms, you can license your show to them. They will pay you um, often in advance or a share of the subscription revenue. Um, that had not existed in podcasting for the previous 15 years, but that is a new piece of uh, potential business for um, podcast publishers who want to use that to offset some of the risk of building their own audience and generating their own advertising mm -hmm. so they can cut deals to license directly into private platforms that have paywalls. Wow. Can I ask you, um, for the publishers or journalists in the audience who are thinking about starting a podcast, do you recommend that people partner with like a production company or try to grow their own? What's the, what's the mix of strategies that you're seeing working in terms of getting something off the ground? Um, it's, there's now a cottage industry of um, freelance podcast producers and editors, and there's now uh, agencies and studios that are available to work with in a way that also had not been true a few years ago, which also means there's a demand for talent, especially at the sort of editor level um, in audio production. So if you happen to be a, a shop that had some of those in your midst, as traditional radio often has, like that's actually an advantage. Um, I think the, if it's a strategy that you're committing to and you feel like you're testing the waters, it makes sense to outsource some part of that production and, and you know, get used to the rhythms of creating a podcast. But ultimately, as the New York Times did, like bundling that in and actually having an audio team in your newsroom um, who treats that as a first-class product and like, draws on the other resources, I think is, is a better strategy and makes for a stickier product. Hmm. I'll just touch on these last two yeah. ones for the business model side. So this is also a trend that maybe you've read about if you're paying attention to the podcast business, and it's an interesting one, which is the IP, the idea of treating the podcast, especially narrative series, as intellectual property that form the basis of something that could be transformed into film, television, or books. Um, and it's not just an incidental trend. It's now getting real investment. So we're seeing Hollywood studios directly pull in podcasts as a way to um, shop uh, shows for the golden age of television, which is happening at the same time. So Netflix and Hulu and HBO and Disney and everybody else are seeing podcasts as one way of identifying something promising um, that might already have a little traction with a fan base that has sort of de-risked the, the concept in some way. Um, and so that's now a pipeline into Hollywood. And then vice versa, they're you know working with all their writers and celebrities are now setting them up with podcasts as a way to you know have another brand building exercise. So this that pipeline to Hollywood from podcasting is 18 months old, but is uh, actually an interesting channel for some strategy. You could develop podcasts with that in mind. Um, and then you've brought this up, which is. Um, and this is a part of our experience with uh, legacy news publishers using podcasts as a way to generate leads to their other businesses. So, you know, for the New York Times and the Daily, um, for sure they've created a hit and they're able to monetize it on a CPM advertising basis. Yeah. But part of their goal, and it's working, is to reach new potential subscribers to the New York Times. And these are listeners, in many cases, who aren't um, readers and they're discovering the Times through the Daily podcast. Mm -hmm. um, they, interestingly, like, journalistically, don't want to do the hard sell, so they actually don't do a lot of um, direct calls to action in the Daily saying, come subscribe to the Times. On the platform side, we've worked with them to t turn those into links that say, we noticed you love listening to the show, do you want to join the email newsletter? And then the next one would be, do you want a 50% discount off the digital subscription? Right. Um, but that kind of you know converting, because the podcast listeners, the core of them are passionately, intensely focused. And if that, that's some of your best customers for other 
membership models or subscription models. And if you can figure out a way to pull them over, you know, then the whole podcast strategy is a, essentially a marketing strategy as uh, to your other businesses. Yeah, it's interesting. I think the daily, <clears throat> just in the last month, has started dropping in a little message at the end that says, if you love the daily, subscribe to our newsletter. And I'd be really curious um, how that's working for them because, you know, it seems to me that one of the barriers to getting a podcast audience to do something else is that podcasting itself is such a um, particular behavior. You, you do it at particular times um, with your phone, you're listening, you're maybe not, you know, doing other browsing at the same time. So getting people to, um, you know, cross platforms, cross behaviors, is there a risk that you're just building an audience that you then can't do anything? Well, with? that's definitely been true. So, I mean, the, the, the digital news publishers who've had, you know, millions of monthly active users on their websites um, repeatedly have failed to turn those visitors into podcast listeners. Like okay. that direction doesn't work. Um, somebody who's scrolling through a page or hit a link in Twitter and lands on an article and is like reading through is not stopping to either listen to long form audio in the middle of that experience um, or you know, clicking to again, uh, you know, get into the episode on a separate app in a separate, you know, moment of their day. Um, that conversion is very small. It's important because of the huge volume of web traffic and a lot of what we've been working on building is a way to harness publishers' major web traffic and then do some amount of conversion. There's smart ways to think about converting that into podcast listening. Um, but I do think the other direction does work hmm. um, in part because it's so distilled. Like the, the ones who are listening all the way through to you know multiple hours of your show are highly um, attuned and are very good candidates to be brought in if given the right appeal. And where do you find those folks? So you, you talked a little bit about um, you know building the audience, but like what, what are the actual tools for finding podcast listeners, cutting through all the noise, getting people to actually open the right app and find you on? Um, on the platform, um, what, I mean, what can people do? The, right now, so like the, but the truest practice for marketing podcasts is to get promotion on other podcasts. Um, so like that, it's it's sort of obvious and intuitive, but the most frequent source of audience are people who are already listening and then getting in front of the shows that they listen to and telling them about other shows. So obviously if you have control over that through your own network or portfolio of shows, that's why you're hearing a lot of cross promotion and there's some interesting production creativity around how to do that. Um, we're starting to, there's also informal sort of uh, barter systems for cross-promoting with other shows. So, you know, if you've got a comparable size audience, you could reach out to another podcast and swap promotions to try to grow your audience for both shows. And that happens all the time. How do you feel about feed takeovers? I hate feed takeovers. I don't know what you mean. Like when you're, you know, there's a, there's a new show that gets promoted in your feed, like the daily yeah. promoted... Um, well, it works. I mean, so it, it's it's one of the uh, sort of ar archaic parts of the structure of feeds, which is it's hard to introduce a new show on a new feed. So sometimes you take the existing subscribers because they're getting each episode delivered into their app, and that's the best way to harness their attention. Um, but it can bug some users who are not wanting it that way. And that's just the failure of the platforms to have fixed that. There's no reason why you shouldn't be able to introduce a new show, and then you immediately pivot to that show without having to take over the feed. Right. That's getting into the weeds a little bit, but there's plenty of ways to improve how RSS functions for marketing purposes. But yes, I'd say step number one is just that kind of cross promotion. And we do see those with the money to do it, like Wondery in the US is a very successful podcast studio that does a lot of true crime shows and others. Um, and you will hear promotion for their shows on other podcasts all over the place, and they're buying ads, essentially. They're buying ads for their shows on other shows, and they're smart about it because they'll drop in usually a cliffhanger, like three minutes of a new podcast with some call to action at the end to hear the rest of the story, go subscribe in Apple Podcasts, and that's actually working for them, and you know they can't measure all of it directly, but they're able to show that that kind of advertising really works. And then I think there's a number of things, and these are things we've been building to manage. If you have owned channels, like you've got your email newsletter, you've got your web properties, um, there's all kinds of ways to make sure that the links you're putting in drive audience, that you can convert them, track them. If you're doing paid social, there's a number of sort of tried and true tactics that you should be using if you have that within your own reach. Um, and then, of course, fundamentally, just make something awesome that people want to hear um, and want to talk about. And, you know, and it's gotten competitive enough that, like, the first 30 seconds of your show better be really good. Um, and, you know, this is why I think you got to be careful about putting 90 seconds of advertising before a new user has even heard the first second of your show. Um, but that, you know, ultimately, great content is great marketing for that reason. Can we talk a little bit about the platform publisher relationship in podcasting? Because we know 
a whole lot about kind of Facebook and news publishers, um, and it's text. Text articles are a different dynamic than podcasting. We you were mentioning how Apple is kind of the um, benign, you know, whatever dictator of the mm -hmm. space. Um, what? Wh how is the platform publisher relationship shaping up in podcasting? And now you're in the unique position of being a platform yourself. Yes, and having been a publisher, so I was traveling too. So, I mean, like I was saying before, part of what's fascinating is that it still is up for grabs. There is no you know, YouTube of podcasting that dominates the economy or the attention for podcasting. Um, and there is no Netflix of podcasting that has like created a hugely successful subscription business. There's plenty of attempts to do that. And Apple, which remains, so Apple is still, it was back in those, for that second wave, um, probably represented 80 to 95% of all podcast listening. Oh. And it's now down to maybe 60 to 70%, in part because of the introduction of Spotify, which by some measures is 5 to 20% of a given publisher's listening, mm -hmm. which is out of the blue because they didn't have, they had zero two years ago. Um, so it shows how much room there is to grow. And they, of course, Spotify has 200 million worldwide listeners for music. Um, and so by introducing podcasting and sticking it on the menu and talking about it, they've grown the audience um, you know, just by elevating it within the menu of things to listen to, which as an industry, I think we're all um, happy that they're doing that. It feels like they're marketing the whole idea of podcasts because most people in the world don't know what it is. I, I, like the word alone is still a confusing word. Um, you know, there's a lot of misunderstanding that it like you requires some technology. You have to like tether your device to your laptop. You know, the phrase "subscribe to podcast" to many uninitiated sounds like something like install Ethernet card. Yeah. You know, it's like it's like this ter <laughs> terrifying thing. So if Spotify can make it just a more understandable concept, that's great. Um, but what we still don't have, and what we kind of wish for and also worry about, is um, serious platforms monetizing at scale. Uh, to drive both revenue and audience um, into publishers. And what would that look like? Like, what's the analog? Well, so that? there's different versions of that future. I mean, you could imagine a future where it's like video and you've got a series of like competitive walled gardens, the Netflix and Hulu and HBO, and you know, they all have a paywall and they have premium stuff you can only get on one service and kind of a catalog of common things. Um, that's one version of it. Another version would be more of a winner take all, like a YouTube like thing, mm -hmm. where that would be most likely be Apple or Spotify. Um, that just becomes the center of gravity and then turns on different business models as they see fit. I mean, that's part of what YouTube has done is evolved its business models um, over time to have tiers of premium advertising to allow a certain amount of creator control, um, but largely just driving the whole ship of it, which um, I think is worrisome, but also would be a huge amount of revenue into the industry. So we're seeing those start to happen now um, with Luminary, which is trying to be a Netflix yeah. model. So they're a paid model, and they've invested part of that giant $100 million raise. They've invested a big part of it into exclusive new premium podcasts that you can only get on Luminary. And there's 40 or so shows. Some of them are from existing podcasters who are well-known, and so the bet is that they'll bring some of their audience over. Mm -hmm. Some of it is that they're just going to try to be, you know, uh, like Netflix has been, you know, create incredible original stuff that somebody will be willing to pay to come. I'm, I'm skeptical about this because I think it's yeah. too early for that or that people will pay for something they can largely get for free still on Apple. And there's not enough kind of, you know, tentpole content that will drive people to leave one platform for another yet. Um, but, you know, those future platform publisher relationships are in play. And part of what I've been trying to work for in the public radio side of it in the U.S., is that unusually um, for a public service media, um, the public radio publishers still dominate the market in terms of reach and audience. So the top in the top five publishers of all podcasting, you have NPR, you have PRX, the company that I helped start. You've got um, This American Life. It's on its own with Serial and other offshoots. And you have WNYC, um, which are powerhouse podcast publishers and reach the majority of the audience but don't yet have their own platform. There is no sort of BBC equivalent of uh, sounds or the iPlayer yet in the US. There's sort of attempts, and we're one of them, Radio Public is, but NPR has NPR One and WNYC bought yeah. Pocket Cast. So there's sort of open question as to whether the non-commercial publishers can make a move while there's still time uh, mm -hmm. to take advantage of their audience reach and drive a platform that would serve their mission and business model, which would include membership and donation, not just advertising, and right. you know the kinds of engagement that we know is really valuable, but otherwise will be Apple's choice or Spotify's choice to regulate. 
Yeah, I mean, I think it's so interesting that we still have kind of one remaining open ecosystem in digital media that isn't um, dominated by a huge player. Um, but I wonder what that means for for news publishers, because I think people have an interest in how um, podcasting can relate to news, and certainly I think there's been some interesting innovations, but it is, it is kind of a strange um, format in some ways for news, especially because it's been so story. And, and not something where you yeah. can be like, let's do it like they do it, because it's incredibly hard and expensive and they've done it remarkably well, but it is really interesting because they've managed to create a journalistic product and podcast that is narrative informed, but is a daily drumbeat around the news yeah. leads. Um, and it's done a remarkable job of you know, going behind the news and getting a sort of look behind the curtain of how journalism is created at the Times, which I think has been great to elevate um, the personalities of the reporters and to open up the brand of the New York Times. But it's so a it different experience than just reading. And it's a different experience. And it's never yeah. going to be, podcasts are never going to be a source for breaking news, and they shouldn't be. So like, you've got lots of places to go for breaking news. And podcast is a reflective, long-form medium that mm -hmm. allows for conversation and analysis and thought and discussion. And this is why I like to mm -hmm. think of it as the slow food movement of the media world, because it's like, you know, Handcrafted, um, farm <laughs> to table, crafted. farm to table audio, farm to table podcast, <laughs> um, and that's just good. Um, but it means that for a news company, like you should think of what ma matches that hmm. mode. Do we want to switch to some questions? Yeah, let's I got some off of Twitter here, so thank you for tweeting. Let's see, we got one, which was about uh, the huge increase. Uh, why why should podcasters consider they craft their strategy um, to make a mark? Well, we talked a little bit about why podcasting. Um, so I think it's really a matter of intent and commitment. And when somebody asks, Jasmine asks, why is there always one advertiser who seems to be taking over all podcasts out there <laughs> at a given point in time? It used to be Squarespace, now it's Quip. We got that the Quip, we got the Quip. We did get the we Quip. Did the, we used the Quip discount we felt, promo we fell code. For it. Um, it's because uh, there's two reasons that are interesting. Um, one is that uh, these that this is a trend of direct-to-consumer brands that are now finding their marketing dollars and most backed by venture capital for marketing purposes and find that podcasts, because of the direct response, is so effective when those promo codes go out that they just keep repeating it. And they usually do it in these campaigns that sort of spread across all top shows. If you go downstream from the top shows, you won't end up hearing the quip one. And it gets more diverse as you go down into the long tail. Um, but that is uh, one of the you know more common channels. Is it also? I mean, I think it's interesting to look at the rise of um, the kind of middlemen in the advertising um, podcast advertising ecosystem. Is it also just that there are not that many people selling ads to those big audiences? So, because again, it's this sort of fragmented path. Like, if you're a brand who wants to reach a consumer, and you know that the podcast audience is super valuable. Um, you can't go to Pandora and say, I'm just going to buy all, you know, women aged 20 to 35, mm. you know, in these, in these markets. Um, you have to figure it out block by block and publisher by publisher and go to their ad sales teams and kind of piece it together, which is one big inhibiting reason why podcast advertising is lagging um, and why lots of people are trying to figure that part out. Um, and it's also, again, I would argue why it's still healthy in that you can't do that kind of precision targeting um, yet. You don't, right. you don't have, you, you haven't experienced yet where you listen to a podcast with an ad for Quip, and then the Quip ad shows up on your browsing and Twitter and follows you around. Like that kind of retargeting is not yet in place. Um, I, hope it does, I hope we can figure out more, better models before that becomes necessary. Yeah, it's hard to think about how that would actually work though because RSS is some actually pretty simple metadata around an MP3 file. It's yeah, not clear how so, you would target, actually. Yeah, I mean, just to the analytics point, and this is not an answer to that question precisely, but the, the question often comes up, what kind of analytics are available? Apple finally turned on some analytics on, on for Apple Podcasts, which shows things like the listen-through rate and how much people listen and tail off, um, but doesn't give you sort of the deeper, direct kind of demographic breakouts right. that some advertisers are going to want. Yeah, there's no, there's no demographics here. But that is that is coming, and Spotify offers, um, you know, podcasters. But again, you have to piece it together as a publisher because you're not on a single metrics on your own terms. Um, but there are standards. NPR is developing one called RAD, um, which is a way to measure advertising effectiveness that is trying to be an industry standard where all different clients and platforms would be able to publish back that data so that you could have a more perfect oh, view into it. Um, and we're supportive of that strategy. So there's a number of those things starting to take shape. Um, we do have a, I think, a mic, we, I think, yeah, so. since we're down to about 10 minutes left or maybe a little less, let's uh, take some questions and yeah, somebody definitely. has the mic to pass around. Up here in the front, yeah. Uh, doesn't sound like it's on. Yeah, it's on. 
Hello. There Hi. you are. Can you introduce yourself too, please? Yes, uh, I'm Jasmine. I'm the one who asked Thank all you. these questions. Mm -hmm. Um, and there's one more question that sure. I'm just going to um, bring up here. So uh, I've been working more in the Global South. I started um, some of the podcasts, two of the podcasts with Al Jazeera. I don't work with them uh, as of uh, six days ago, but I'm uh, looking into starting a few other projects. Anywho, what I'm interested in is what have you seen in terms of developments uh, from the Global South in terms of podcasting? Because it's super, super interesting. Mm -hmm. There are um, countries that are listening, when I looked at our analytics, that are listening to podcasts where English is in you know, the native language and, and, and they're rising. Yes. With Japan, Singapore and whatnot. Um, yep. So what is it that you've seen there? Um, mm -hmm. So we're starting to see a lot more of it. We're actually working on a partnership with um, a Chilean podcast network that is, um, you know, aggregating together a lot of uh, Latin um, Latinx podcasts, and you know, the audience for that. Um, because the localization in the platforms hasn't been there, it's like still fragmented too. So the question is like, what's the dominant consumer access point for that? And is it gonna be Android? Is it gonna be iOS? Um, but the growth in the publishing appetite and the growth in the audience is clear. Um, so at least from where we sit, we're excited about pursuing that kind of partnership. And it is interesting to see that, you know, elsewhere in the world, um, you know, a place like in the UK where the BBC is very dominant, podcasting is an independent, entrepreneurial ecosystem is less developed, but then you have China where it's a whole other beast entirely where the Himalaya app um, there has hundreds of millions of paying subscribers because it's more like paid education subscriptions where you're like using it as like lifelong learning and paying per channel um, for somebody that you're learning from. So it's a multi-billion dollar business in China, which was surprising. Yes. Hello, hi, my name is Astrid. Germany and we do a podcast um, that is around technology and how it um, changes businesses and lives. And uh, my question is, what have you found to be the most effective way to grow your audience? Because I think we haven't talked about this here right now. Yes. Um, so I do think a lot of it is the brute force marketing around cross promotion. Um, and then there's a certain amount now that the platforms, if you get into, like Apple has a marketing team and if you, and they're doing it uh, localized too. So they have uh, for Europe and for um, other territories, they have a podcast marketing point person and you can get in touch with them. They actually will occasionally respond to email and they will have requirements for how to feature your podcast or make sure you're giving them a heads up that there's like a news hook around it or you're launching a new season. Um, and they'll do some retailing of that with you and you give them better graphics and they might put it up on the top of the homepage. And that's true for other platforms too. So now it becomes more of a task, but you can go to Apple and to Google and to Spotify and to Pandora and to Radio Public. And we have a, po a dedicated podcast librarian on our staff whose job it is to be, stay on top of all the new shows um, and then curate them and present them. I do also think, um, you know, there are some tactics. We think of curation as a content marketing strategy too, um, because there's still the majority of your audience might not be habitually using podcasts, introducing podcasts to them by saying, here are seven great shows um, about you know visiting Italy, um, and you curate a list of those shows, and ideally you annotate each episode saying, here's, here's why this is a great episode, and you include your own in that list. Um, but that becomes content marketing, which lives out on the web as a landing page on your website or blog, um, you can provide it as a playlist, which then can actually surface into some of the apps, like our app. Um, so I do think this editorial strategy can also be a content marketing strategy, which works really well. And then I do also believe that if you have owned and operated channels, your email newsletter, your web properties, there's a smart way to make sure the links and the embed players and the way that you actually, like, in a technical detail, like, make sure that those links are going to an easy to open uh, device specific way to you know get into the podcast so you shouldn't be showing this is the thing I was asking about Android versus iOS um, if you send out a link to Apple Podcasts to your Android users they can't actually open it <laughs> um, so and there's now intermediaries that do smart URLs and switch them out based on sniffing which device someone's holding and that all that stuff is infrastructure to use for smarter marketing got a question back there um, uh, yeah, I, oh, I, I'm, I'm Linda, okay, and I, I, I put one of the tweets in Thank you. Uh, asking about whether or not this would be useful for podcasters in the UK. Sorry to sound so uh, sort of nationalistic here, but one thing that occurred to me, you were talking about advertising. So if, if I put my podcast on your platform, mm -hmm. what would happen about the advertising? Because obviously if, if the adverts were things from the US, that would not go down too well with, you know, my my listeners. So is there a... Are you actually sort of changing the adverts according to what the 
programs the, are. That's so yes, there's two different ways. So on Radio Public specifically, we actually do have a program called Paid Listens, um, which any podcaster globally can participate in, where, um, I think we have it here somewhere, let me see, where um, we will place an ad in front of your podcast, but um, you get paid a guaranteed per listen rate, $20 CPM. Um, right now, those are just house ads, and they're not swapped out, and they're not country-specific, but it's okay. We just pay that as a guaranteed rate. What we have seen is that um, the more sophisticated publishers are now, based on IP and geolocation, um, selling regionally their ads. And so a company like Acast and Audioboom in the UK are, are starting to rep the, represent the inventory for U.S. podcasters to sell there. Um, and vice versa, if you had a big enough audience in the U.S., there's now ad networks who will take on your show and just put on ads that are relevant to a U.S. audience. And it does mean that U.S. podcasters are starting to discount the impressions they're getting outside the U.S. If it's an advertiser, if like Quip isn't shipping to the U.K., they're not going to play the Quip ad. Okay. But I think Sorry, the, 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 oh, the, the plat, but the platforms are not they're, they're not generally selling advertising. So. You know, it, if they're it's baked, to, it, they're yeah. starting to. But in general, if it's baked into your podcast, you're selling it. You're selling it. Yeah, you mostly podcasters control their own advertising. Okay. We have more sorry, questions. Sorry, yeah, be quick. just is there an ideal length for a podcast in your experience? Uh, well, you pass that along. I'll answer that question. So there, there is no ideal length. Uh, sort of a commute length, which is often twenty to forty minutes. Um, but you know, there's Joe Rogan's podcast. God help him, uh, is like three and a half hours long. That's the, one of the most popular <laughs> ones out there. Hi. Um, hey, I know that guy. Yeah, Jake. Hi, it's Anthony Brooks. Um, <laughs> I work at WBUR, which is the public radio station in Boston where Jake and I live. So nice mm -hmm. to travel 3,000 yes. miles to ask you a question. <laughs> um, <laughs> so my question is about newsroom organization for legacy radio newsrooms that are getting into podcasts like WBUR. And I'm just wondering if you can talk a little bit about... Um, sort of models of organization that work really well. Because on the one hand, we have a lot of the skills to yep. do podcasts, right? We've got editors, we've got writers, we know how to manipulate sound. But the experience that I've seen, and I'll just talk about my own shop, is podcasting has sort of been ghettoized yes. a, a little bit. And I think it's a lost opportunity, and it's a conversation that I have yet to make progress with with the folks at WBUR. But I'm just curious about your view on this. That's great. Um, let's squeeze in. I'm going to hold that and answer it, but I want to see if we can get one more in, and we'll answer both at once. You can collect them. Okay. Well, Maybe you yes. Are you going to collect them? How are you gonna, yes, we'll collect a few, and then I'll answer that one, too. Hi, then. Uh, and by the way, we'll, we're, when we're ending in about four min five minutes, um, we'll continue out at the bar. <laughs> okay, um, I'm going to speak for an audience which is normally not represented in podcasting. I'm Romanian. My name is Bogdan. And basically in Romania, podcasting still does not exist as a phenomenon. Mm -hmm. Radio is still very linear and very non-narrative. What are the tips from the big markets for a future emerging market of podcasts? Thank you. Uh, my name is Miles Smith from Internews, and we do media assistance all over the world, but including in the U.S., where we have some assistance programs for small, medium-sized U.S. outlets. I'm just curious if there are successful models in these smaller cities, 100,000 people, 50,000 people, play space, where the advertising market would be totally different. It's not a national audience. Is there any evidence yep. for success there? Great. Um, this is a slight add-on from your question. Um, how many people or members of the team... Hi, I'm here. <laughs> um, Roughly how many people or members of an editorial team and production team would be needed to release a weekly podcast, let's say, yeah, in between 20 and 40 minutes? Got it. And are there any formats that you've noticed are particularly successful, like creatively? Mm -hmm. Great. Maybe one more and then we're going to have to rush through them. Hi, thank you. Uh, so there was a question up there, like who should not podcast? Yes. So I wanted to know that. <laughs> and maybe, yeah, like the worst mistake we m might do or some like easy tips and tricks for beginners. I don't know. Okay. Yeah, the reason I put this slide up, by the way, is that there's some amazing resources here that we've pulled together. This isn't just about Radio Public. It's a list of articles for each step of the chain of starting a podcast, including like training availability, tools and recommended microphones and studio setups and the freelance networks and then improving um, editorially, marketing and sales. All of this is here. We just released this about a month ago and has a lot of the most current you know, resources around each one of those questions. Um, I think a lot of people shouldn't do podcasts. I, you know, there's a great New Yorker cartoon of two people sitting at a bar and one is saying to the other, I'm thinking of stopping a podcast. 
uh, which is like I, I, I'm doing, I take a lot of podcast pitches that just shouldn't exist and there's a lot of sort of misguided thinking that it's easier to do or that there's, it doesn't yet exist or just because you think it should exist, it shouldn't. Um, so if you're not ready to commit to it and you're not ready to like uh, devote a lot of time and not see an immediate return or you don't have someone who's like authentically passionate about it um, and if you don't have, if you're at an organization, uh, organizational buy-in um, to Anthony's point, um, you know, where at a high level it's seen not as like a rogue element, but something that's core to the strategy. Finding a strategic hook back into the core mission of the station or the organization, which is why I think thinking of podcasting not just on a CPM basis and advertising, but if you think of it as member engagement or lead generation for your major donors eventually, or something editorial that will feed the rest of your business, coming up with a rationale um, that, that isn't just too thin because of the low lagging advertising dollars is I think a key way in. Yeah, what am I no. missing on the other questions? Um, I just want to make a quick point. We, I gave the same advice about email newsletters yesterday, which is like always link it back organizationally. It needs to have an editorial strategy, but also a revenue strategy, and you can't uh, And that gets to the local them. market, the smaller market question too, which is um, actually PRX has been running a really good program called Catapult, which is working with local public radio stations on sort of design thinking for podcast production, both to figure out your audience, figure out the production methods, figure out the marketing piece of it. Um, but also, I was talking to some of the McClatchy uh, local newspapers um, as well in smaller markets where when they thought of it as something that elevates their brand around a mission purpose or support our newspaper and it's sort of marketing to potential subscribers as opposed to the local ad sales. Local ad sales is hard um, on, on podcasts. But if you think of it again, if it's like a broader lens about why the podcast is created and you can widen that to rationalize a different, sometimes in case a different budget. It's like literally out of the marketing budget instead of out of the production budget. And how many, for the teams that they're starting, what are the production... Size. So yeah, in terms of like a size, like you know, it, it depends on how self-contained. If you have one of those amazing host producer editors who just like the unicorns of the business, and they do exist, um, you just then you should hold on to them and find them or train them. Um, they can actually move mountains um, on their own. And actually, some of the best podcasts started as that solo shop. Um, often you don't have that. It's usually a three, at least a three-person team of a host, an editor, and a producer. Um, you know, the Daily, actually, when they launched, only had three people for the first like, couple months of it. I don't know how they pulled it off. Now they have a team of 25 um, to produce that kind of a show. So um, it, uh, it can be bootstrapped as you go on a weekly show. I definitely think it's one to two people can get started, and I would encourage you to start with one. Um, you know, like, and grow it as you earn it. Uh, and ideally, someone who has the, the, the critical quality, um, which is the elusive one, is hostiness. That's what I call it. So hostiness is the thing that you know you can't buy um, and you can't sort of interview for, and it's a latent quality. So part of what's great about Michael Barbaro, he was a writer in the New York Times for a decade. Who knew that he was an unbelievably good podcast host? And sometimes it's like the intern or like the production assistant or somebody in marketing. It's not necessarily the existing front person who's head of communications or the CEO of the organization. Mm -hmm. People who are passionate about it and are ready to devote the time to it and have that stickiness with an audience. Um, that hostiness, that is gold, and that can drive the entire business of it. And finding them is your task, if it's not you already. Uh, I think like we're, I think to we're going to have to do the rest of them. I will respond on, on Twitter, and then we, I wasn't kidding, we're going to go out to the bar. <laughs> um, and then go here on the link if you want to get the deeper resources and download Radio Public on your app, and we'll make, make it all go. Thanks. Thank you.